Welcome to On the Middle East, the podcast of the award-winning media service, El Monitor, where each week we talk with the decision makers and thought leaders who are making the news and shaping the trends in the Middle East. I'm Andrew Parasoliti, president of El Monitor, and our guest today is Dan Shapiro, distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council and former U.S. ambassador to Israel. I first met Dan nearly 20 years ago when he was legislative director for then Senator Bill Nelson, who is now head of NASA, and I was foreign policy advisor to then U.S. Senator Chuck Hagel, who went on to be Secretary of Defense. In addition to his time with Senator Nelson and other staff appointments on Capitol Hill, Dan's distinguished career in government includes serving as President Barack Obama's senior director for the Middle East and North Africa on the National Security Council from 2009 to 2011, and then as U.S. Ambassador to Israel from 2011 to 2017. Most recently, during the Biden administration, Dan served as senior advisor to the U.S. Special Envoy on Iran, Rob Malley. Now at the Atlantic Council, Dan has the lead in the Council's work on Israel and in its N7 program, which is dedicated to advancing normalization, peace, and stability in the region in the wake of the Abraham Accords. Dan and I will be discussing what to expect from President Biden's upcoming trip to Israel, the prospects for the Iran nuclear deal and an Israeli-Palestinian peace process, further normalization with Arab states, and the next round of Israeli elections this fall. My conversation with Ambassador Dan Shapiro begins now. Dan, welcome to On the Middle East. Thanks, Andrew. Great to be with you. Let's get into it. U.S. President Joe Biden is planning to visit the region next month. The first stop is Israel on July 13th. The Israeli coalition government is in the process of folding and elections are now being planned for the fall, either October or November. How does the Biden visit play into Israeli domestic politics? Does it help foreign minister and soon to be interim prime minister Yair Lapid, who is, by the way, likely to face former prime minister Benjamin Netanyahu this fall? Tell us about what you expect in Israeli politics and how the Biden visit plays into that. Well, Biden's uh, team in the White House obviously uh, anticipated that this could happen uh, when they planned the trip. This coalition has been uh, essentially teetering uh, since it started and certainly in the last uh, two or three months as uh, individual members of parties at its uh, respective right and left wings uh, found it difficult to support different initiatives eventually uh, broke off from the coalition. So this was something they took into account uh, as they did the planning for the visit. Uh, and of course, Biden, uh, being Biden, will play it straight. You know, he'll, he will uh, be greeted by whoever is the uh, prime minister at the time. It was going to be Bennett. Now it looks like it will be Lapid in an acting capacity. There's even a scenario, although unlikely, where it could be Netanyahu if you could pull together a 61-seat government even be, you know, in the next two weeks. Um, but Biden will uh, treat this as a, a relationship between two countries, a strategic partnership that transcends whoever is the sitting president, whoever is the sitting prime minister, uh, and he'll go about his business on working to advance uh, Israel's integration into the region, U.S.-Israel security cooperation, trying to improve the atmosphere with the Palestinians and preparing for the next phase uh, on Iran, depending on how the nuclear talks end up. And that's an agenda that he would work with whoever is the, is the prime minister. Um, obviously, for uh, Lapid, who uh, was the, in some ways the senior partner in the outgoing coalition, he had the most seats, 17 for his party, and Bennett only had seven seats, uh, which then actually he lost some. Um, it can't be a bad thing to be seen by the Israeli people uh, playing that role, uh, receiving the president of the United States, who's uh, obviously a good friend of Israel, uh, speaking for the country on these important strategic issues. Uh, there's no question uh, that any politician would uh, derive some degree of benefit from uh, people seeing him. Lapid has, uh, seeing him play that role. Lapid has been now in politics uh, since 2013. Um, and uh, he's uh, progressively built a real party and taken on the increasingly senior roles in government. 
Um, but uh, he has not yet sort of crossed that threshold where uh, the Israeli people necessarily see him as uh, the prime minister. This role uh, that he'll take on uh, in mid-July uh, will obviously help burnish that. Uh, but I think uh, Biden will be very careful not to say anything or do anything that uh, seems to provide an endorsement. He'll, I expect uh, the normal protocol would be to have a, a, a respectable short meeting with the leader of the opposition, that's Benjamin Netanyahu, who he also knows for, for many years. Um, and uh, Netanyahu will, will certainly try to impress upon him that they might find themselves working together uh, several months from now after the election and a government's formed. But, uh, you know, there's a long, long road to play. By the time this voting actually takes place in late October, early November, uh, the Biden visit will be, you know, quite uh, in the rearview mirror and uh, the normal issues that define the outcomes of Israeli elections, which interestingly often is really at the margins, does a small party uh, make it into the Knesset with four seats, or does it just miss the threshold? And then its votes essentially go to waste and the, the votes are redistributed in another way that benefits different parties. Um, obviously, Netanyahu's uh, long tenure, but also his corruption trial that continues to, to, to go on, uh, the tensions between uh, religious and secular Israelis, between Arab and Jewish Israelis. Uh, those are the issues that will define uh, what is the actual outcome of this election, and which, of course, produced four stalemates and, and may yet produce a fifth. Uh, and so I think, you know, in a lot of ways, the Biden visit will be uh, sort of a, a footnote uh, by the time the voting actually takes place. Dan, I want to ask you uh, your personal take on Netanyahu, how you see his prospects for a return. He's facing a, a court case. He, uh, the, the parties, the coalition government that came together seemed um, united mostly in their opposition to him, but he is back in the arena and has a strong chance of being prime minister again, as you just pointed out. You were ambassador during a scratchy time in U.S.-Israel relations. You dealt with Netanyahu as prime minister. Tell us your take on, on him and how you see his political future in the coming months. I worked very well with him when he was prime minister. I was ambassador. That's an ambassador's job. And uh, there were definitely uh, periods of significant disagreement, even tension uh, between the Obama administration and the uh, Netanyahu government. Uh, but we were always able to work together. Uh, he obviously had a different atmosphere when he was working uh, with the Trump administration. Um, you know, at a certain point, of course, he had been, by the time uh, he left office, he had been in office 12 consecutive years, plus three years from the 1990s. Um, there's no question that he sees himself as a, a unique figure in Israeli history, maybe with unique leadership qualities and knowledge and experience. And uh, he believes he should lead the country to the point where uh, he has uh, stayed in the leadership of the Likud party, even while uh, dealing with a corruption trial that's ongoing. It's a very, very long, slow judicial process in Israel. Um, and that has certainly contributed to uh, his inability over the last four elections to win a, a, an outright 61-seat uh, government. Um, and there are those who say that there's frustration within the Likud party uh, uh, by those who feel that any other Likud leader would have been able to form a 61 seat government because there are parties in uh, the Bennett Lapid coalition who ideologically are really oriented uh, to the right of the center, right of center as Likud is, but uh, their leaders, you know, Saar is an example, Bennett himself is an example, Avigdor Lieberman is another example, uh, simply refused to sit with Netanyahu. They had themselves long histories with him, they've uh, had conflicts, they've had uh, periods where they felt that he uh, didn't fulfill commitments to them. Uh, they, of course, cite the the, the, the trial. Um, and so they say they would sit with a, a, a in a Likud-led government if it was, wasn't led by Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, so, you know, he knows that. He knows there are those pressures and nevertheless uh, feels that, you know, he has something unique to give the country. And uh, uh, he still has a very strong base of support uh, within the party uh, and even within some satellite right-wing parties. So uh, he remains the most popular politician in Israel, polls in the 35 to 40 percent range of people who uh, think he is the most qualified to be prime minister. Likud, in almost any scenario, is likely to be the largest party uh, in the Knesset, as they are even now in the opposition. Um, and uh, the real question is, will uh, he be able to push uh, just above let's say the 30 seat mark where Likud sits about, and now it's about a quarter of the Knesset, and will some of the other parties who were 
refused to sit in his government uh, fall away because uh, uh, you know they they have smaller bases of support and uh, maybe people are disappointed that this coalition didn't last. Will some of his satellite allies, the ultra orthodox parties or the uh, very far right uh, religious Zionism party, uh, will they gain and have just enough seats to put him over the 61 seat margin? Um, the polls are are uh, suggesting in this early stage of uh, of an election season. Uh, that it's too close to call, uh, that it could easily tip either way. Uh, there's a long road to go, uh, and it will really be decided at the margins. So uh, he's he's in the arena. He has a chance to be the next prime minister. But of course, uh, after four consecutive elections where he could not put together that kind of a coalition, uh, there's certainly every possibility that there could be a fifth election with a, with a, with the same kind of outcome. Dan, in your last government role, uh, you were senior advisor to U.S. Iran envoy Rob Malley. And as I understand it, you were directly involved in communications between Jerusalem and Washington about Iran and the Iran nuclear deal. Outgoing Prime Minister Bennett considers it a win that he got President Biden to not delist the IRGC as a terror group. And the prospects of a nuclear deal, at least today, seem slim which Bennett, I think, considers a, a key success of, the, of his government. Help us understand Israel's position on the Iran deal and how you see the prospects for a return to the JCPOA at this point. Are the U.S. and Israel on the same page? The U.S. and Israel uh, during the Biden administration and the term of this government uh, certainly disagree on the bottom line about uh, whether or not a return to the JCPOA is uh, desirable uh, or the best available outcome. I mean, I think one of the things that's important for people to bear in mind as they consider this issue is that uh, Biden, upon taking office, was faced with two pretty bad choices, two pretty bad options. Uh, those are the ones he inherited from uh, decisions made by his predecessors. One is to return to the JCPOA halfway through its 10 to 15 year term, so with maybe six, seven, eight years uh, left, uh, with Iran having made significant advances uh, in its, uh, uh, in its uh, nuclear technology in the meantime, uh, so that you couldn't get the original 12 month breakout that the JCPOA promised for those six or seven years, you would get maybe six or eight months, something in that range. Um, Iran, of course, would receive uh, sanctions relief and significant revenue with which it could fund a number of its uh, non-nuclear uh, aggressive activities, terrorism, missile programs, UAV programs, uh, and the like. Uh, and so that's a somewhat unappealing option. It's uh, only that the other option was even worse, which was because Iran had uh, advanced its program once uh, President Trump withdrew from the agreement uh, and now sits essentially on the threshold of having a uh, enough uh, enriched uranium for a nuclear weapon, it's essentially a nuclear threshold state. And so if we do not go back into the JCPOA, that's the new reality. And going forward, we will all have to deal with Iran as uh, uh, essentially uh, having achieved that nuclear threshold state status, only awaiting its ability to actually weaponize uh, the, uh, the materials into a, into a bomb. Now, the Israeli position uh, has been uh, uh, well, it's, uh, to back up, the Israeli position all the years I worked in the Obama administration was that they would never allow Iran to cross that threshold. They would never allow uh, Iran to have what they called a nuclear military capability, which is a lower threshold than a nuclear weapon. And they defined it as exactly what it is now, having one sufficient quantity of enriched, highly enriched uranium to produce a bomb. When Benjamin Netanyahu drew that red line in the famous speech at the United Nations in 2012, that's what he was expressing, that Israel was not going to permit Iran to cross that threshold. And that was actually something that the JCPOA delivered on, at least for the term of the deal agreement. Uh, it could keep Iran below that. So it's a, actually a fairly significant shift uh, in Israeli thinking that among the available options, uh, and again, uh, one has to be clear that all the options are pretty bad here, uh, they're prepared to live with Iran for some period of time uh, in that status. Uh, and then we're shifting into somewhat different mode. We're shifting into a deterrence mode, which is not a mode we've needed to be in. We've been in more prevention mode for the last couple of decades. Um, we, uh, the Israeli concept is that uh, after uh, the JCPOA is declared dead, uh, European sanctions could snap back into place. Uh, additional sanctions could be applied against Iran. And then under even greater economic pressure, uh, Iran 
uh, would uh, be willing to agree to a, an even tougher deal where they'd relinquish uh, this uh, status that they've achieved as a threshold state and they'd put in place even stricter constraints for even longer periods of time uh, to make sure they can't ever achieve a nuclear weapon. I think that's a, a fairly dubious uh, prospect that Iran would actually agree to those things. Iran has, certainly has shown a willingness and even an ability to uh, hunker down and uh, and and uh, absorb the pain of sanctions. They look for other outlets through China, through Russia, through other uh, trade partners who are less uh, committed to enforcing existing sanctions. Um, so I think it's a it's a questionable assertion that they would uh, ultimately be brought back into a tougher deal. But again, we may find ourselves in that situation simply because uh, Iran and the United States have not been able to to agree on it. Uh, the, the president, I believe, was right to uh, not uh, agree to designate, uh, to remove the IRGC from the terrorist uh, designation uh, list. Uh, they, uh, this is essentially an issue outside of the uh, bounds of the JCPOA. And uh, the US position on that, uh, as I understand it, uh, it's been articulated since I've left government, uh, is that if Iran uh, wants to make demands or get additional concessions that are not related to the JCPOA, it will have to put its own uh, concessions uh, into the discussion as well. Uh, and the IRGC obviously conducts and sponsors terrorism uh, around the region. Uh, if uh, Iran uh, wants to talk about removing Iran from uh, the IRGC from the AFTO list, uh, they should talk about uh, ending those uh, activities. They shouldn't just get it as a throw in uh, to a restoration of the JCPOA. What are the chances, and in, in your view, I know you're out of government, whether there would will be a JCPOA, you worked on, on the account with, with Rob and, and others, and how do you see uh, the discussions around a plan B, or I should say the US, Israel, and others have been discussing a plan B for dealing with Iran, should there not be a JCPOA renewal? Uh, What's the nature of those discussions? And, and obviously, if, if there is no JCPOA and Iran is now, uh, the timeline is, is shortened from a year to, to weeks, uh, what do you think that does with regard to decision making and planning in Israel and dealing with the Iranian threat? I think neither side, neither the United States nor Iran, has an interest, at least not yet, in declaring uh, the talks dead in declaring the effort to negotiate a return to the JCPOA failure. And that suggests that both sides feel they have something to get out of it. I've explained what I think the US has to get out of it, which is buying time. It's not more than that. I don't wanna suggest it's a, it's, a, it's a final solution or final resolution to the uh, Iran uh, nuclear uh, pro uh, problem, uh, but it would buy uh, more time than any other alternative. And the alternative is leaving Iran to the threshold stage. So that's the US interest. And I think the Iranians have come up fairly long way in those talks because they actually do want the sanctions relief that's promised uh, in uh, those talks. Their economy is in terrible shape. There's food riots and, and other protests about uh, inflation, the inflationary pressures there. Uh, and they've sold to their people, this new government, the Raisi government, and actually marketed to uh, the people that they would be able to deliver sanctions relief that the previous government did not. So I think they have an interest uh, in, in getting there. So neither side will declare it dead yet, uh, but it's certainly on life support. Um, uh, whether or not uh, it uh, could be resurrected later this summer or in the early fall, I, I suppose we'll have to we'll have to see. I, I think in some ways, uh, President Biden's decision uh, to remove the discussion of the IRGC uh, FTO uh, decision from the table is actually helpful uh, in prospects to get to the deal because it clarifies for the Iranians what the choice is. They either get into the deal on its own terms or they make a decision and then they have to justify it to their own people uh, why uh, that's not happening. Uh, so it would not shock me if later in the summer, uh, sometime in the fall, the talks uh, found some new life and uh, there was an effort to, to look for a, a, a way to close this out. But uh, I, I wouldn't put high odds on that. I think uh, we may uh, all have to prepare for a reality where, uh, where there's no JCPOA. The plan B discussions, uh, in some ways, there, a lot of what one would do in plan B without a JCPOA is not all that different from what one needs to do, even if there is a return to the JCPOA. Uh, Iran is going to remain a significantly threatening uh, country uh, to Israel, to the Gulf states, to many other US partners, to the US presence 
uh, in the region uh, generally and, and our interests generally, uh, regardless. And so uh, there's a, a lot of work to do uh, on, and some of this will be uh, discussed during President Biden's trip, both to Israel and to, to Saudi Arabia, where he'll meet with a, a large number of regional states. Uh, uh, to integrate the air defenses uh, of uh, the uh, U.S. partners, which can now be done more easily under the leadership of CENTCOM, because Israel is a member of CENTCOM uh, and brings its uh, military, its missile and uh, UAV uh, defense technologies into the table. Uh, to put additional pressures uh, of sanctions on uh, Iran uh, when uh, they conduct acts or sponsor acts of terrorism or uh, ship weapons to their proxies in Lebanon and Yemen. Uh, and, and elsewhere uh, to interdict those weapon shipments. Israel has an ongoing campaign to prevent uh, weapons from uh, Iran from being uh, uh, installed in Syria. Uh, much more can be done on the interdiction front uh, toward Yemen, uh, perhaps uh, toward other arenas where Iran tries to send its weapons. Um, uh, ensuring that uh, the international community is speaking uh, in a united way uh, about uh, Iranian uh, terrorist activities and Iranian uh, abuse of its own people. Uh, the regime is, uh, is, a, is a terrible human rights abuser. Um, and so there are a lot of ways that you would uh, uh, coordinate the regional and even the international environment uh, to increase pressures on Iran for all of those things, whether there's a deal or there's not a deal. The real question is, if there's not a deal, are we uh, going to also have to put in place uh, a, a kind of a deterrence uh, structure uh, to our uh, relationship with Iran or to the Iranian nuclear program? Um, you know, Israelis, uh, of course, uh, have never taken off the table, and you know, as a sovereign country, that's uh, every right uh, not to do so. Uh, the option of a military strike, uh, if uh, that's necessary to prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon. Of course, uh, President Biden himself has said he will never allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon. So if we are in a mode of, uh, of Iran as a threshold state and in a deterrence mode, those conversations obviously have to uh, continue. Uh, it is interesting to note that even though the Israeli government's position has been uh, against a return to the JCPOA, it's not difficult to hear voices from within the Israeli security uh, establishment, certainly within the IDF, uh, both recently retired and even currently serving uh, members, who uh, make some different points. They, they argue that uh, Israel uh, actually needs more time uh, to uh, really put its own military option into the, into, the, uh, into, the, uh, into the position where they'd really been able to use it. Uh, and there are some who argue that they would benefit from the time that a return to the JCPA would buy uh, rather than be put under the uh, pressure of perhaps needing to uh, operationalize a military option much sooner. Uh, so those are conversations that I'm sure also will take place uh, within uh, the context of the Biden trip and beyond. Uh, I'm now many months removed from uh, anywhere close to those conversations, so I don't want to suggest I have any uh, real-time uh, insights of these very, very sensitive conversations. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the need to treat Iran as a, uh, the hostile state they are, uh, the uh, aggressive state uh, that uh, threatens its neighbors, including Israel with destruction and uh, including its Gulf neighbors, uh, is not gonna change whether or not we get back into the JCPOA. And you are presently involved in, at the Atlantic Council in supporting Israel's further normalization with Arab states. And the prize here is of course, Saudi Arabia, where Biden will go after he visits Israel in the West Bank. There are reports that Biden and his team are working on a roadmap for Israel-Saudi normalization. Where does this stand and what can we expect from a roadmap for this Biden trip to both countries, Israel and Saudi Arabia? Uh, President Biden's team has been working uh, with the Saudis uh, really from the beginning of the administration uh, on uh, a uh, phased process uh, that could lead to full Israeli-Saudi uh, normalization. Now, of course, that's uh, gotten tangled up with some of the tensions uh, in the bilateral U.S.-Saudi relationship. Um, obviously, there's the, the long overhang of the terrible murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, there's uh, other uh, actions taken by uh, the Saudi uh, leadership that have been uh, hard for uh, uh, the U.S. to uh, uh, kind of uh, accommodate within its own interests, including more recently 
uh, not being as full-throated in uh, condemning Russia's uh, uh, invasion of Ukraine uh, or suggesting that there may be a strategic option for a relationship with China. Uh, and so these tensions uh, have, uh, I think, in some ways complicated the path toward uh, Saudi-Israeli normalization because uh, you know, it, it would make most sense uh, for all these parties to be working well together as, the, as that process would unfold. Uh, I actually think the decision uh, by President Biden to travel to Saudi Arabia is, is very significant uh, and, and very important and very difficult. Uh, I don't underestimate uh, the uh, debate that uh, must have taken place internally, uh, the uh, sense that uh, there are, remain many um, outstanding issues, certainly those relating to human rights uh, with Saudi Arabia on which we're not in, in agreement and which we'll have to work on over time. But I do think a, uh, a fundamental a strategic uh, priority of ensuring that our uh, Middle East partners and Saudi Arabia as, as, as a lead partner are orienting their policies toward US interests and not toward Russian or Chinese uh, interests when our uh, interests are in conflict and, and the Ukraine war is the, the clearest current example. Uh, is, is is something that the president has has correctly decided uh, warrants making this trip, uh, seeking uh, increased Iranian uh, oil production, not primarily to affect the cost of uh, gas at the pump. Uh, that's not going to happen in, in in a very real uh, in a very quick time frame, but rather to increase the bite of sanctions on uh, Russia and to ensure that there are non-Russian energy uh, supplies available on the market for European countries. Uh, so I think this is the correct thing to do. Uh, obviously, the Saudis are looking for additional U.S. commitments and guarantees about their security vis-a-vis -vis the threats they face from Iran. And I think uh, that conversation is also uh, coalescing. In fact, the Abraham Accords and Israel's participation in CENTCOM help make that possible. You have the emergence of a coalition of like-minded U.S. partners in the region, all focused on the same threats, pooling their knowledge, pooling their resources, working together. Uh, to attend to their own security needs with the U.S. as a partner, uh, but not always as the lead, not always as the tip of the spear. In fact, I think that's uh, a recipe to help the U.S. presence in the Middle East remain as a, as a sustainable pitch, uh, rather than uh, have force us to surge in beyond what the American people are ready to, to support or to withdraw beyond uh, what our interests uh, can, can, uh, can sustain. Um, now, again, in the context of that progress on U.S.-Saudi bilateral uh, relations, uh, it's certainly uh, the right moment for the Saudis to take a, a step toward uh, normalization with Israel. What's on the table for discussion, it appears, is uh, the restoration of Saudi sovereignty over two islands in the Red Sea that uh, were under Egyptian control during the 1967 war. Uh, but uh, if the Saudis control, uh, the, the, they would have to guarantee Israeli freedom of navigation uh, in those waters, um, but they would have the restoration of, of control over that, uh, th that Saudi territory. And then in exchange, uh, a decision to permit uh, Israeli civilian uh, aircraft to overfly Saudi Arabia. El Al Airlines and other non-Israeli airlines flying to and from the Far East uh, over Saudi territory, which saves a lot of, a lot of time and, and fuel costs. Uh, those would be meaningful steps, uh, but you know, would leave a lot of room still for uh, ramping up to a full recognition, exchange of embassies, uh, uh, security, uh, open security partnerships. I think the Saudis are making very clear that uh, they're moving in this direction. They recently allowed uh, Israeli business uh, people to come to Saudi Arabia on their Israeli passports. Uh, they're very interested in a range of Israeli technologies. Uh, and uh, the security relationship, intelligence, and otherwise has existed for many years uh, beneath the table. And now it, again, under CENTCOM's leadership, can start to uh, emerge a little bit more to the surface. Um, whether or not they're really going to be able to announce or, or codify an actual roadmap of steps and a timetable uh, to uh, get to full normalization, I, I, I wonder. I, I, you know, this is a a process. Uh, there's different views even within the Saudi uh, leadership. The king, who's in his 80s, uh, probably adheres to a more traditional and slower uh, uh, view and pace of, of this kind of change. Uh, the crown prince uh, representing a younger generation and uh, really have a different set of priorities uh, seems to be uh, willing to move faster. So whether the Saudis even internally are prepared to you know, put on paper uh, what they would do in what period of time, I think, is uh, is not clear. Uh, but I certainly hope and expect that uh, the visit will uh, facilitate 
some meaningful steps forward and some indications that there will be additional steps uh, later and that uh, that's all moving in the trajectory of eventually Saudi Arabia joining uh, joining uh, full normalization with Israel, which will be a big win uh, for the United States, uh, for our interests, and, and uh, obviously for uh, the regional coalition that uh, we work with to secure our interests and, and their security. And with the collapse of the Israeli government, it seems the prospects of advancing Israeli-Palestinian talks are even more remote. What can Biden do during his visit to advance negotiations, if he can do anything? And how much of a priority is an Israeli-Palestinian peace track, uh, how much of a priority is that for this administration? The uh, situation that uh, the Biden administration inherited uh, on the Israeli-Palestinian track certainly didn't lend itself to any significant progress. And they, uh, I think, made a decision that uh, given on priorities elsewhere uh, and given the poor prospects, uh, if one were to somehow pull parties to the table to negotiate, uh, that that was not the right uh, approach. And I think they were correct about that. Uh, they came in, I guess Netanyahu was still prime minister at the time. Uh, he was soon succeeded by uh, Bennett at the head of this uh, very diverse coalition. Certainly neither uh, the Netanyahu government nor uh, that government with its wide range of views and Bennett's own you know, fairly right-wing views on this issue uh, was not uh, in a position to make uh, any significant uh, gestures or, or, gestures or uh, uh, concessions. Uh, on, uh, on on negotiations, but one also has to say the Palestinian leadership is in a state of significant uh, uh, disarray uh, as uh, President Abbas ages, and uh, he is uh, a succession battle is underway already. Uh, so I don't think there was any real sign that the Palestinian leadership was going to be in a, a position to uh, make any significant moves in negotiations. So they were looking instead for ways to improve their situation on the ground through. Uh, economic improvements uh, for Palestinians uh, to uh, sustain and, and, and where necessary upgrade security cooperation between Israelis and Palestinians uh, and to look for uh, opportunities to uh, break down some barriers. Uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Middle East Peace Partnership Act, the MEPA uh, program that uh, facilitates uh, a, a significant funding, $50 million a year of funding uh, by the United States for uh, Israeli-Palestinian people-to-people programs, uh, really trying to scale a peace building uh, effort at the grassroots level in order to provide uh, and buttress, uh, uh, provide support for and buttress leaders making tough decisions in negotiations So somewhat later down the road is underway. Uh, the Abraham Accords themselves uh, offer some opportunities for Arab states to become uh, more engaged uh, as uh, brokers or as partners in uh, Israeli-Palestinian dialogues, or including Palestinians in some of the exchanges that are bringing Israelis and Arabs together for the first time, uh, and perhaps also through their resources investing in the Palestinian economy. So I think they've looked for ways uh, to uh, provide uh, some uh, stability and some ballast uh, on the ground to improve conditions for Israelis and Palestinians. Certainly they have uh, tried to discourage uh, actions by either side that only make uh, a return, an eventual return to negotiations and in reaching an agreement uh, harder, such as uh, Palestinian payments to uh, terrorists in Israeli prisons, such as uh, the expansion of settlements in areas that uh, would very likely be part of a Palestinian state and a two-state solution. Uh, so. Uh, they've had mixed uh, success or not full success at all uh, on, on those efforts. Um, I think, uh, you know, President Biden will uh, certainly see President Abbas and uh, certainly restate uh, the U.S. commitment to a two-state solution. Uh, but I do think that in the interim, uh, they are uh, focusing on trying to improve conditions on the ground, trying to uh, lower the barriers to an eventual return to negotiations or return to um, uh, 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 some discussions about a final status agreement, but they are really not uh, expecting that that's going to be possible uh, in the current leadership dynamic until there's some, uh, certainly this election plays out in Israel and, and they see what kind of government they're dealing with there. Uh, probably uh, it, it may require a transition of leadership on the Palestinian side as well. Uh, actual negotiations uh, are unlikely and certainly unlikely to succeed if they're convened 
Uh, and so uh, there's, uh, um, you know, the, the, the better uh, the available choice, it's not uh, that satisfying, uh, is to try to uh, lower the barriers to an eventual return to two state uh, talks, uh, but only after there's some change in leadership. And how complicating for Biden and for U.S.-Israel relations will be the reported recent Israeli settlement activity and the killing of Palestinian American journalist Shireen Abu Akhla? Well, again, Biden uh, has been critical of that settlement activity, and uh, he will be. I don't think he'll uh, hold back on uh, stating his view on that on, uh, uh, on, on his trip. Uh, the really tragic uh, killing of Shireen Abu Akhla, uh certainly continues to warrant a, a proper investigation, uh, and that's been the uh, administration's position as well. They've encouraged uh, Israeli authorities and the Palestinian Authority to work together on that uh, negotiate on that investigation. Uh, I know from you know my experience and some uh, similar uh, cases. Uh, that actually getting those two sides to trust each other enough to, to work together or to, to get to the bottom of the, uh, the story is very, very difficult. Uh, so I'm not sure that that's going to be possible. Um, uh, you know, of course, uh, her killing is very, very tragic. Uh, the investigation must uh, take place, of course, in addition to uh, her status as a journalist and a, and a Palestinian. She's an American citizen. And so uh, the U.S. government uh, certainly has an obligation and an interest in, uh, in getting to the bottom of it. Um, but of course, all of these types of tragic situations are, uh, you know, they can be viewed on their own terms and, and be dealt with a, 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 in their own, on their own merits, but they are also symptoms of a conflict that uh, remains stuck, uh, that is not going to be resolved uh, until eventually uh, parties, uh, both parties sit down at the table and uh, think about what a different future uh, looks like. Uh, as I said, the current leaderships don't seem to be the ones that are likely to be able to do that. Uh, so uh, I, I know Biden will raise these issues, uh, but again, they, they are symptoms of a bigger problem. Uh, and the bigger problem is not solvable now, but uh, he is trying to put in place uh, a somewhat better atmosphere so that, uh, that uh, the, the possibility still remains uh, for uh, a resolution through negotiations in two states, uh, but somewhat later down the road. And this has been great. I uh, need to note or amend my um, introduction of you in the beginning that uh, you reminded me you were an L Monitor contributor in the past. Uh, you've also been a guest on Ben Caspit's uh, On Israel podcast. He says hello, by the way. And it has been a real pleasure today to have you join us on on the Middle East. Hopefully we'll have you back again soon. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate what you and everyone at All Monitor are doing and uh, appreciate the opportunity. We will return after this short break. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Hagedorn and I'm the State Department correspondent at Al Monitor. And I'm Joe Snell. I'm Al Monitor's video editor. Let's admit it, this past year has been difficult to stay on top of the news and sift through what's accurate and what's misleading. Let Al Monitor help you. If you care about the Middle East and North Africa, you should consider listening to Al Monitor's audio series on the Middle East with Andrew Parasoliti and Amber and Zaman, and on Israel with Ben Caspi. You can now watch our newest video podcast, Reading the Middle East with Gilles Capel. You can subscribe to these series on your favorite podcast platforms. And through a host of free daily and weekly newsletters, we offer a range of perspectives with the highest journalistic standards. You can subscribe to these newsletters at almonitor.com. As an award-winning media service headquartered in Washington, D.C., Almonitor has a network of over 160 contributors around the world. So if you haven't done so already, be sure to visit almonitor.com, where you can find all of these newsletters and podcasts along with first-class reporting and analysis. Thanks to our guest today, Ambassador Dan Shapiro, and to our production team of Beowulf Rockland and Rosabel Hine of Two Squared Media Productions. We will be back next week, and if you haven't done so, please sign up for all three of our El Monitor podcasts at your favorite podcast platform. Reading the Middle East with Gilles Capel. Gilles' guest this month is renowned Israeli-French artist and playwright Amos Gatai. And On Israel with Ben Caspit, where Ben this week speaks with Gil Messing, the chief of staff and head of global corporate communications at the Israeli tech company Checkpoint. 
they're going to be talking about thwarting Iranian cyber attacks. And of course, this podcast on the Middle East, where I will be here next week with another decision maker or a thought leader in the region. Thank you all for listening, and please keep up with all of the news and trends in the Middle East at lmonitor.com.